le mafu a angalende na ilo o le tanga o le tata u isambo o le malanga a se de to alua se au si mai si ti ile pasalolo. The goddesses Te Ma and Tila Fenga. They swam the oceans to Fiti to learn the ancient knowledge of Tatao, given by women, worn by women. On their journey back to Samoa, they emerged seasick and confused. And their story got reversed. When they reached Savai, they told that it was the men who got the tatao, the pe'a. But a tatao for women still survived. Malu. This is the gift that keeps our stories alive. The Malu embodies everything about being a Samoan woman. to get my malu in Savai because this is home for me. This is home, this is my identity, and I wanted this to be part of my journey with my mom. Being able to go back and have my malu in the region where the tattooing reached Samoa by the two goddesses, Taima and Sila Fainga. To me, that's quite powerful. It's like everything coming together. born at Suasivi Hospital and have spent most of my life in Savai. My father passed away in 1984. <laughs> I come from a very big family and my mother raised the seven of us with family in the village. when we went to school, so it was a really <laughs> surreal experience to look Balangi and not know how to speak English. <laughs> mm. To me, I believe Malu is a very visual display of 
your identity. So for a lot of young women who are growing up abroad, coming home to get a malu is somewhat a visual representation of their connection to Samoa. So my mom is a very strong woman and she is the chief. I think that it affects a lot of us now. We are not faced by the ability to be a leader and being a woman doesn't hinder that. Uh, my mother got her malu in the 80s and when she got it, we were intrigued and in the back of my mind, I believed I was going to get a malu one day. But she's a firm believer in um, you don't just walk off and get a malu. You have to earn the right to wear it. It's such an important thing and, and mom has uh, really influenced how I see tattooing or the malu. It's a bird. Ah, oh, okay. You see the birds uh, right you flying. I, I love my mom's malu. She fashioned it after her grandmother's malu. Um, but she also looked at Krema book, the Samoan Islands, and she looked at the patterns in, in Krema, and she wanted to fashion it in that way. It's like a gift for women, and so being able to, to get one and having her blessing at, is so important for me. Photo Samoa, that's actually a title. Or, uh, you know, but I named her to make sure I I So I think it's better properly dressed before you open your mouth. <laughs> You know the women to make sure Women nowadays need to understand what Malu stands for. Malu is keeping the, the mamalu of the family, because uh, in the olden days, the, 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 the women folk keep all the, uh, the genealogies, and, because Samoan women always had a place in the, in the community and the society. They've always had a, a voice. There's a covenant between the Vatapuya, or that sacred between the, the, the brothers and the sister. The girl is there weaving the fine mat. That's why the girls also have their hands done to show that she is the leader of the Fale Lalana, or the Matua U, or Seepapa. That's the significance of, of the tatau and the back of the hands. So uh, it all builds in and she has, uh, mostly, she has the last word. So the empowerment of women and the uh, Samoan community and society always had Nafanua and all those, they, they were girls, Salmasina, they were not men. It's actually very, uh, quite emotional, like, um, you know, I've been traveling the world uh, tattooing and to, this is actually my first time to bring back 
the craft or the tools back to the homeland of, of La Vea or Lie Faiwa. So um, it's actually very significant. If you really look at it, this was our written language. Ah, like, if you really look at the world, the creation of the world, there was always this tendency, how can we pass down our knowledge? Ah, now you see there are rocks. I mean, even in the Bible, you know, they, they found uh, the carvings on the rocks and, and things. So I'm sure this is what we, what our ancestors, they were trying, how can we record? So for me, this is our, our, our written language for like, you know, the building of the family, the behavior of the ole malu, e malu wa yainga. I just think it's, it's really important to, to keep it or to maintain it for our future generations. And it's part of our history. I mean, Balangi have their histories in books, and we have our histories in the patterns on our bodies. It tells a story, and it also gives you a sense of not just pride, but responsibility. So bringing my daughter was important because I wanted her to go through the experience with me. Up preparing for the day, and then it happens, and you realize it's just another another day um, in the village. People are talking, the chiefs are sharing, and it makes it almost natural to get it um, in the village. I feel good, really good, especially that they are all speakers. It's a Siva for so, you look when you are performing, you must be properly dressed. Uh, and not only by body, but only by eye, only maka, only huku. You Olewa <laughs> I love my new legs. <laughs> you know, getting tattooed, it's sort of like all the taboo about everything we know about the va between men. And then you're standing there and you feel completely exposed, but it's it's okay for this occasion. And then you've got men all around you and you surrender your body and you're just lying there. And you know, it's like your body is not yours for those few hours. Imagine if in the future you had the opportunity to have a woman tattooing women. Wow. Oh, when you could get
Tamoko is the style of mahi that I do. Translations using patterns and symbology that's relevant to their whakapapa or to their story. I just feel like having no electricity involved in the process just connects us closer to our history, you know, how we used to do it back in the days. And I like that about it. It feels like a completely different experience. Um, this is kind of reserved for something quite sacred, I believe. Life needed to feel completed, you know, like it's a sense of a completion, a sense of maturity. There's been so much broken in our lineage from being separated from our land, from being separated from kaupapa Māori, tikanga Māori, our language. And it's been actually about closing that circle. Livia Maiden, Takoto Maihine, Kiatangi ya ngutu, so that your lips may be marked and darkened. Moto haere ki te whare tāpere so that when you go to the dance hall, whare tāpere, the place of amusement, you will be beautiful. Here in Aotearoa, there has never ever been a time ever in the history of this land, in the human history, when there has not been a woman walking the land with a marked face. I actually think too that men were going out in the early 20th century, they were working, they were much more engaged with Pākehā than women were. And up until 1950 or so, Aotearoa and Māori were a rural community. We were safe on the marae, in the pā, in the hokainga. And so the tradition continued, like women being actively marked. Much of the erasure of women's participation in certain traditional art forms is caused by Victorian misogynistic Christian ideologies, which um, suited the guys. You know, it privileged them. One of the most exquisitely gifted tāmoko artists of the Māori world in the early 20th century was a woman called Kuhu Kuhu Tāmati, who inscribed a number of faces throughout the Upper North Island. Now, why don't we hear about her? So I learned from my, um, my tūnga. Um, still learning though too, I feel like I feel like I'm definitely still a tawira, I'm still a student, you know. I guess just that whole connection of wahine to wahine, you know, it's uh, um, that understanding, that mutual understanding that we have as women. And um, because it is quite an intimate experience, um, and sometimes they want it in places that, um, you know, they feel more comfortable with a woman touching them than a man. 
You cannot beautify a female face without shedding blood. The practitioner is not only an alchemist, but also a healer. Um, I know of people who have taken kauai or taken other forms of moko to recover or to start a journey after miscarriage, after hysterectomy, after the loss of a parent or a child. In 1997, I just had my lips done um, after about seven years of considering probably the most, the key thing to that was worthiness. It was worthy, good enough, I don't know, brown enough, speak enough Māori, just enough. It came to me through a journey of healing from um, identity, but also as a survivor of abuse, sexual abuse, violence. So there was a dual journey of recovery, healing, and then one of discovering identity and self, who I am as a, a woman, a mother, uh, a sister, a survivor. The Rua Whetu came years later, and that was when my mother had her moko kauai done. So I started with myself, then my older sister had hers, and then my daughter had her kauai, then the other daughter had hers. But she said, well, if my daughters can and my moko puna do, then why, why wouldn't I? For us, it was significant and myself because it was three generations of living wearers of moko kauai. It's definitely significant and it's getting some momentum too. <laughs> There's a lot more young wahine that have that are feeling the calling for it and um, and kind of letting go of all the barriers that have been put in place by other people's um, thoughts and um, just owning it really and they feel strong enough within themselves to make that decision for themselves. Standing up and owning it and that's what this is for me, standing up and owning it and just saying, you know, no matter what anyone says, no matter what anyone thinks, no matter what anyone's judgments or opinions are, this is mine, this is my, from my tupuna. This is my papa. Every Māori female with a whakapapa has the right as a mark of survival, as a note of resilience, as a reminder to the treaty partner that we are still here. And we are here in our entirety. Right behind me is my tupuna, and koia tona ingoa um, te amaroa ngā tohu. I carry my moko, her moko, our moko. When you've got ink in your skin, it is there forever. And so when you make that commitment, and particularly to your face, um, there is no going back. There's none. It's OK to have a bumblebee on your bum, you know, or a butterfly on your breast, but something here is... It is a mark of identity um, and it is a declaration to the world about you. Now you have to be sure who you are and you have to take responsibility for being that person. I wear this for my whanau. It feminised me. It's it's true, it changed my life. I'm here 
wearing or carrying the marks of mana from my own great, great, great and great and grandmothers. I'm from Mekia and I was raised knowing the space between men and women. And so we have rules about who you dance with, who you sit next to, and they're pretty strict. As a woman, marking women and sort of sharing stories and knowledge as a woman, it's a safe zone. And I think with men marking women, it's a completely different energy from when women mark women. And yeah, I think it's a lot louder too <laughs> when women mark women. <laughs> stories, laughter, crying, all of that happens, so yeah. Um, so I started marking 2013, we did both hand push and, um, and hand tap. Our tools were made with lime and lemon thorns, not, not bone, not um, tusk or any of that. So um, it was incredibly painful. <laughs> Cannot believe they went through that, like what they actually went through. And you know, the fear, this is the old women remembered the, the pain um, of being marked and the amount of blood and then having to go back and do the same area again. And then these young girls not wanting to ever experience that kind of pain and why would you do that? Um, but, you know, so, <laughs> which is why hand push is so much more gentler than lime. Julia's my cousin. I think it's been a whole journey of learning what the connections are, the loss of tattooing um, and the significance of it. Cultural, it's an identifier. Melanesians, we are extremely practical. Um, not to say that we're not poetic or, but all of our stuff is grounded in um, practicality. So as beautiful as they are, two things. They're a storyboard that sort of tell what's been happening with you. They transition you from a young woman to an, to an older woman. They're identifiers. So I know that this person is from such and such. The same for Polynesian marks. When you look at them, you okay, this guy must be from Samoa because I think in a practical sense it was because our women married and they go to the men's village, men's clan. So if there's any warring, um, they fight, 
this man will look at this woman and know she's from us, so we don't touch them or their children because that relationship, that's family. But they also show the strength of women. They also show what this particular woman can endure. So if she can endure this, then she can have babies. She will work super hard in your garden. <laughs> you know, so like they are a visual statement of um, the strength of that woman, but also the strength of the woman's family and the line before and what will come next. So it really, the marks are about our women and how amazing, like how strong they were. And, the, um, and they were loved for it. I'm a walking signboard. <laughs> that's, but that's what it is. I'm a walking signboard of, of being Papua New Guinean, but what it means to be from Mekio. And I know I'm a walking signboard and I own that. Yeah. It was the work that she was doing that brought my own attention to my grandmother's tattoos, our grandmother's tattoos. It was a realisation that um, she was actually the last one in our family, like in our village, to wear Mekio designs specifically. So that kind of hit home and then realising, yeah, oh my gosh, I am so guilty of completely looking past my grandmother and not seeing what was so special about her and that she was actually, you know, she went through all of that. That's our thing. I'll get you to sit up. And we have a look. Oh. Oh. You are covered. Yeah. So I think when I'm working with these women, like they're incredible because they walk in and they just trust um, the whole process. It's special because um, of my bubbles. So it's theirs. And I think. Um, there is no change. This is almost an, an exact. And that's what it is, living, living their skin. So that's the difference as opposed to the other ones. I think Papua New Guineans are extremely lucky because we're fortunate, because we've seen it. We've, we've seen it alive on skin. When I went to Fiji and um, realised how much they've lost and how they don't have the practical use of the things that they have in their museum, I feel like the longer you've lost it and the more colonisation and the more brutal it has been, it's much harder for the people now that are trying to bring life into what was. We haven't lost that. We're here. This is the studio where I work, Karanga Inc. on K Road. Um, it is an indigenous tattoo studio owned and operated by women. I specialise in Samoan Tatao and I work with other um, patterns from around the Pacific. I think it's really important that people understand the significance behind what they're wearing because those are the stories that we need to keep alive through the marks and if you don't understand what you're wearing then we sort of lose an aspect of that in a sense. The time the light and my spirit cries. So 
I think it's really, really important that we have these conversations and we talk about the symbols and what they mean, which is what I do with the people that I work with. I mean, yes, you can have that visual signifier and that's certainly one way to connect, but I think it's important to remember the deeper meanings as well. So going back to Samoa is um, really significant for me. I'm going back to um, reconnect with my family. My grandfather who passed away in 2008, so it'll be my first time being back there since his funeral. I'm hoping to um, reconnect and spend some time with the Sulawapu family who I've been working with on and off um, since about 2011, um, very, very slowly progressing towards um, taking up the ao and learning the traditional uh, methods of te tau. As far as I know, the legend ends when the tools were given away to us by the girls. But I believe that uh, that my and Hilfinger were artists, were the artists that brought the, the art and the tools. But when they gave it to Sua, that's when uh, the women oh, was not in the picture anymore. Part of our country, it's part of us. No one can take it. I'd love to teach, love to teach. I, I, I asked my, my girls, who, is, who wants to be a tattoo artist? And uh, they freaked out, you know. Just because, maybe because of me teaching them or because they don't like me. Well, maybe it's because of, uh, of that Vafalwai uh, between the, 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 the brother and the sister. Because in our culture, we regarded, we men regarded all the girls, Samoan girls, as sisters. You know, we really for Samoa, but... So maybe that's why they, they, the girls didn't do it. But uh, as I said, there's no, no rule, and, and no one can stop me teaching the girls. I guess I was always really conscious of stepping into that space um, that maybe wasn't allowed for me or that I shouldn't be in because I am a woman. Um, but, I, but also, I guess, being familiar with the oral history surrounding Tatao, I know that women were involved and, and did play a part. So I guess I always had that sort of in the back of my mind and I thought, well, if I don't ask, then I won't ever know. So, you know, had he said to me, no, that's not your place, then I would have... I would have taken that on board. <laughs> but yeah, I think having that, that support means a lot. There's a lot of pressure. Um, I think that it will really open us up to a whole new way of experiencing the manu. Um, I've even heard of some families having reservations about their daughters receiving the model just because they don't necessarily want them in that situation with a man. You know, of course I think about Taima and Tila Whainga and, and the female goddesses that brought to Tao and our connections with them. Um, but I also feel that it's timely and that we are ready as well. Back in the days, I remember it was late 70s. That's when uh, lots of women got tattooed, when, that's when Polo was working. But before that, you hardly see anyone who's a Malu. And I don't know why. And if they get the Malu, they hide it. They don't show it, not like these days, uh, you know, with shorts and that. 
It's like a fashion now. Before it was uh, sacred. So the women that got tattooed the beginning of the century, they don't show it until uh, weddings and that, you know, that's when they show it. I think that's when the girls uh, saw it was, uh, you know, it looks good on, on, on women, and that's when they, they started. Last week we tattooed a, a woman who was 67, 67 years old. I asked her why she's old, and she said, I've been wanting it when I was a kid. I, I would love to die with, with a mother. To me, as it's really about family connection, as my mom has one, and my dad, and my late dad. So this is kind of special to me, you know. Just the only, both Tyler, huh? she's my niece. <laughs> and she's the only thing that dad leave us with my brothers and their kids. And this is how strong blood is. It connects me to the land, it connects me to my heritage. It's about honouring the designs that I work with. Just such a privilege and an honour. Yeah, blown away by how supportive that they have been and how open they are in sharing this practice with me. Um, yeah, just... <laughs> So much emphasis is put on the ocean, on the distances between us. But the real river, the real energy, the real currents, I believe, is in the blood. And it's the blood that spills when you take ink. It's the blood that links us together. Moko is about transformation. And I think Pea and Tatao and Kakao, all those traditions state the same thing and serve the same purpose. And what is really exciting is that it happens on the living human body. And I think there's nothing more erotically raucous been a bunch of inked polys, Māori, Samoan, Tahitian, Hawaiian, jumping around together, showing each other their ink. You know, it, it really is an incredible celebration of who we are through our ink. We are putting our marks back onto our bodies so that we can be in touch with our ancestral past, so that we can remember. I always tell kids it's, it's who we are, it's who we want to be and it's essentially our libraries. This is our Google. And for me personally, because there's so many stories embedded in the marks, they consistently keep me in contact with our histories. It's not something that I can just put away in the cupboard, not like maybe a dance costume, where you do your dance and then you put it in the cupboard and maybe stays there for another year. When you're tataud, it's present. You are present with your ancestors every day, and it's a great reminder. In the Cook Islands, we call it maru. So that is reclaiming that art form.
Because we didn't have any records of a maru in the Cook Islands, um, but we know that we were heavily tattooed and that women wore on the legs, it just made sense that we had a very similar design sense to the malu of Samoa, but the patterns is what defines it and makes it different. So you'll notice on my maru that I've used patterns like the pupu inano, like the maruitiki and the mokora and the papabaro and the manutai especially, this one that I really um, connect with, that reflect who I am and my connection to the Cook Islands. I think my maru speaks quite a different language and it's reconnecting to my ancestors. So in, in more of a way than say um, getting a tattoo on my arm or you know anything like that. What my maru does is I'm trying to reclaim what's been lost. We've seen a lot of revival happen in other parts of the Pacific Islands. Definitely starting from the Polynesian Islands and moving across the Pacific and the Philippines was kind of one of those last places to have that momentum to really share with the world the revival and sharing culture and to do sharing tattoo work. In the Philippines, uh, in the past, women were the tattooers and now we are continuing that tradition. A lot of our people have chosen not to remember and so this is why the tatak is so important is that we need to reawaken the revival and have a voice. It's one of the loudest ways that we can solidify our identity. A lot of the patterns are similar, you know, we have, uh, I know some of the vegetation is specific to islands, but there's a lot of things that came over, you know, just like how the, you know, Polynesians came from somewhere before, you know, and so it's really neat to see almost like an evolution throughout uh, time. Through the marks, you can see where the different voyages, so there's a definite connection to Southeast Asia, just through the designs, you can see it. What you see on repeat are frigate birds, centipedes, they're everywhere, but then also the diamond. You can see that, and it doesn't start with us, it goes further. The diamond, for me, it's become a woman's symbol and how women are the foundation of life. So the mal, the diamond mal shape, to me, is sort of the be all and end all of the female tatau. It's where all life starts. It's the fale. It's all aspects of a woman. It's connected to childbirth, fertility, femininity, um, our place in society, our place within our culture. So it's everything in that one little pattern. So that is why I think people do sort of react and get conscious of how it's used. When I first sat down with, with, with Paolo, I'll start with Paolo because I used to go, well, you know, oh, what's the malu? And, he, and the first thing he said to me is the four sides of the house. He looked to me, he goes, well, what's the first house you live in? And I was like, oh, of course. It's the house of the people, it's the whare tangata. If you read the malu, the messages of the malu, uh, it's about our story of creation. The growing of the seed is protected by custom, by usage, by, hu by history, but most importantly by theology. And the malu means, you know, how do you protect, you know, the making of the human being. Ipufakairo is a carved gourd, but it's also a metaphor for the mons veneris, like for the private parts of a woman. And in both of these metaphors, um, contained within the context of these incredibly erotic, raunchy, fabulous ancient chants, are all these references to genital tattooing, like to the marking of the gate through which a new human will come into the world. Cambridge, I found a diapot called an okongara, who made of stone. This particular vessel was used only in the tattooing ceremonies of women on their private parts by other women. It's 
So in the Fijian practice of traditional tattooing, uh, it was women who marked and women who wore the marks. When it was practiced in Fiji, it was about the movement from girlhood to womanhood, a sort of triangular marking on the mons pubis, on the, the vulva. Uh, it goes around the waist and it's on the buttocks. I don't know why it was so important to mark that area. I mean, it's the center of the universe. has brought the importance of my body back to the forefront. Fijian women's tattoo was discontinued with the advent of Christianity. When Fijian women put on the mu'umu, everything from neck down became invisible. And so our bodies are not written into history. And that's a tragedy. What wearing these marks means is it's unshackling ourselves from the burdens of colonial hang-ups. I've had to confront my own relationship with my body. I've had to confront how other people might see it, how other people might see the sharing of it. Accepting who I am, and that's a powerful thing of being marked. The female has always been present in the story of Tatao from the twins through to the Fijian woman's Vinkia, through to the Papua New Guinea woman, through to our Filipino cousins, the, and, and in Tahiti, and with Māori. There's always been women present in this art form, and especially within the mythologies. So I think when the men came and they wrote about men's things for men's, <laughs> They didn't acknowledge that all were shown that these beautiful markings were, were specifically for us too, so that'll teach them. <laughs> I think that that journey of women bringing the akuau to us, the journey is a long thing. Ah, you know, ole, ole malanga, ole malanga te tōrua. So the journey needs to be continued. Uh, there is no end to this journey. And each of us and each generation have a responsibility to help that journey live on. Uh, and not just in our memories, but now on our bodies, on our skin. So what Dai Ma and Tila Whainga brought then will continue into my great-grandchildren's generation that speaks to them about who they are as women and what their roles and responsibilities are because a malanga needs to be hosted. Uh, we need to be able to host those stories. We need to be able to care for those stories. We need to be able to keep that legend and keep that story going. Uh. I cannot understand why, as a young person, you would choose to wear tattoos that are barbed wire or a flower, when you could be wearing your grandmother's marks all the way back to who knows when, when you could be wearing, in our equivalents, diamonds. This is the gift that we've been given. These are our marks of mana, and we have to keep it alive. Sing on.